Welcome to the Word Made Flesh podcast, where we explore the life, teachings, and legacy of Jesus Christ as told through the Bible. I'm your host, Fitz Criddle, and I'm excited to dive into this fantastic topic with you. In today's podcast, we'll take a deep dive into a passage from the New Testament that offers a profound insight into the heart of Jesus. So grab your Bibles, get comfortable, and join me as we embark on this illuminating journey into Matthew chapter 11. The subtitle of this podcast is Revealing the Heart of Jesus Christ. I thought that would be a great topic for episode number one of the Word Made Flesh podcast, The Heart of Jesus Christ. When I searched the scriptures on this subject, there's only one verse in the New Testament where the heart of Jesus is distinctly mentioned. It's in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. But I don't want to start in verse 29. Instead, I want to read it in its literary context. You may be asking, what is the literary context? It's a crucial concept of biblical interpretation. Now, the literary context refers to the surrounding words, verses, chapters, and even entire books within the Bible that provide valuable insights into the meaning and significance of a particular passage. It's like stepping back to see the bigger picture, zooming out to understand the author's intended message. When we examine the literary context, we consider various factors. First, we look at the immediate context, exploring the verses that come before and after the passage in question. This helps us grasp the flow of thought the connections between ideas and any specific instructions or themes that might be present. In fact, understanding the literary context brings the Bible to life and helps to avoid misinterpretations and enables us to grasp the richness and depth of God's word. And the great thing is that we live in a time where most of our Bibles are already aligned and the chapters and verses into their literary context. If your Bible has headings in each of the chapters, that's a clear indication of literary context. And sometimes literary context can go beyond chapters. Sometimes a, a phrase, a thought, or literary context may go into the next chapter. But for the sake of time, I'll read sort of the immediate context of Matthew. So I'm going to start in Matthew 11, verse 25 through 30. In Matthew 11, 25 through 30, and I'll be reading the ESV translation or English Standard Version. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly, in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The verse we're focusing on today is, of course, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. It holds tremendous significance because it's the only passage in the New Testament where Jesus straightforwardly mentions what his heart is like. So let's take a, a moment to reflect on this remarkable detail and unpack its meaning. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. These words spoken by Jesus provide us with a window into the very core of his being. Beyond his role as a teacher, a healer, a miracle worker, these verses reveal the essence of Jesus' heart. It invites us to explore his character and understand how he relates to us on a deeply personal level. The first attribute Jesus shares about his heart is gentleness. 
in a world often marked by harshness, judgment, and unforgiving forces, Jesus offers a stark contrast. His gentleness is not a sign of weakness, but a testament to his compassion and nature. It speaks to his ability to care for the broken and wounded, providing solace and healing to those who seek him. Now, Matthew stresses Jesus' gentleness. You can find that in Matthew chapter 18, 1 through 10, as well as Matthew 19, 13 through 15. But I want to take a look at Matthew 18, and I want to read verses 1 through 6, also in the ESV. And the conversation is around who is the greatest. That is the disciples' question that they had, and they were talking about this. And so in verse 1, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? <laughs> now, verse 2, and calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it will be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. The pulpit commentary states that Christ points to little children as the model to which the members of his kingdom must assimilate themselves. The special attributes of children which he would recommend are humility, unworldliness, simplicity, teachableness, the direct contraries of self-seeking, worldliness, distrust, and conceit. If you were to read Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 in the King James Bible, it uses the word meek, but most current English translations use the word gentle. And I enjoy looking at the etymology of a word, meaning its origin. The word gentle, our English word gentle, is derived from an old French word gentil, G-E-N-T-I-L, which originally meant noble or of noble birth. It can be traced back to the Latin word gentilis, meaning of the same clan or belonging to a family or tribe. Over time, the meaning of gentle expanded beyond its association with noble birth to encompass qualities such as kindness, meekness, and tenderness. Today, gentle is commonly used to describe someone or something that is considerate, mild-mannered, or exhibiting a calm and caring nature. The term gentle can also be used as a verb, meaning to handle or treat someone or something with care and tenderness. It denotes an action that is done with sensitivity, avoiding roughness or harm. In summary, gentle originally referred to noble birth, but has evolved to describe qualities of kindness, tenderness, and consideration. It is a versatile word that can be used to describe both people and actions. Now, the word meek is an adjective that originated from the Old English word miok or miok, spelled M-E-O-C, which meant gentle or kind. Over time, the meaning of meek has evolved, but it generally refers to someone who displays qualities of gentleness, humility, and submissiveness. A meek person is often perceived as mild-mannered, patient, and easily yielding to others. However, it is important to note that meekness does not necessarily imply weakness or lack of confidence. Instead, it suggests a demeanor characterized by a controlled and humble nature, where strength and assertiveness are tempered by self-restraint and a willingness to avoid unnecessary conflict or aggression. This is the very essence of the heart of Jesus Christ, and particularly to his earthly ministry. And it is reflected in the depths of the sacred text. Because Jesus could have usurped all of man's authority, all of man's will, and he could have forced us to worship him, forced us to obey him, but instead 
he came to earth with a heart of gentleness and lowliness and that of humility. So let's talk about that, act, that next attribute. Let's talk about the second attribute mentioned is lowly or humility. Jesus, the Son of God, choosing to highlight humility speaks volumes about his character. Despite having every reason to assert his authority and demand reverence, Jesus exemplifies humility in his interactions with others. It reminds us that true greatness lies in selflessness and service rather than seeking power or recognition. One of the most notable demonstrations of Jesus' humility is seen in his incarnation. Jesus, the Son of God, willingly took on human form and lived among humanity. This act of leaving his divine glory behind and assuming the limitations of a human being can be seen as the ultimate act of humility. Throughout his ministry, Jesus taught his disciples and followers about the importance of humility. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells his disciples, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Matthew 23, verse 12. He emphasized that true greatness comes from serving others rather than seeking personal recognition or status. Jesus exemplified humility in various ways. He associated with people from all walks of life, including tax collectors who were hated, sinners, and social outcasts, showing no regard for social status. He washed the feet of his disciples, an act performed by servants during the Last Supper, illustrating the importance of serving others without considering oneself superior. Jesus also demonstrated humility in his interaction with those who opposed him, responding with patience, love, and forgiveness rather than seeking revenge or retaliation. The ultimate expression of Jesus' humility was his sacrificial death on the cross. Despite being innocent, he willingly suffered and died for the sins of humanity, bearing the punishment that was rightfully ours. This act of selflessness and humility serves as a cornerstone of Christian theology, highlighting Jesus' willingness to submit to God's will and his love for humanity. The humility of Jesus teaches believers the importance of having a servant's heart, prioritizing the needs of others and avoiding arrogance or self-centeredness. It encourages individuals to approach relationships and interactions with humility, love, and compassion. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. When we consider these qualities together, gentleness and humility, we began to grasp a deeper understanding of Jesus' heart. It reveals a heart that is tender, approachable, and compassionate. It shows us a heart that longs to ease our burdens and bring peace to our souls. But there is more to this verse than just a description of Jesus' heart. It offers a promise, a promise to rest for our weary souls. Jesus invites us to take his yoke upon us, to join him in his mission, and in doing so, find true rest. It is an invitation to trust in his guidance, to learn from him and to experience the rest that only he can provide. In a world filled with chaos, anxiety and relentless busyness, Jesus' words bring hope. They remind us that we are not alone in our struggles, that there is someone who understands our deepest pains and offers a refuge for our weary hearts. Jesus, with his gentle and humble heart, invites us to find solace in his presence. As we explore Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, let's reflect on how this passage speaks to our own lives. How can we embrace the gentleness and humility in our relationships? 
I say this especially to Christians. How can we find rest for our souls amidst the demands of everyday life? These are questions that require introspection and a willingness to align our hearts with the heart of Christ. Throughout the New Testament, we encounter numerous accounts of Jesus' interactions with people. We witness his compassion, his tenderness, and his unwavering love. Matthew eleven twenty nine provides us with a glimpse into the source of these qualities, the heart of Jesus. Let's take some time to meditate on the transformative power of Jesus' heart. When we truly grasp the significance of his gentleness and humility, we can experience a profound shift in our own lives. Let's explore some practical ways we can incorporate these qualities in our daily existence. One way to cultivate gentleness in our lives is by practicing empathy and compassion towards others. Jesus was deeply attuned to the needs of and struggles of those around him, and he responded with kindness and understanding. We can follow his example by actively listening to others, seeking to understand their perspectives, and extending a helping hand whenever possible. Small acts of kindness and compassion can have a ripple effect, spreading love and gentleness in our communities. Humility, too, is a virtue we can develop through intentional effort. It involves recognizing that we are not the center of the universe, but rather part of a greater whole. Humility allows us to embrace our strengths and weakness without seeking validation or superiority. By humbling ourselves, we create a space for others to shine and foster an environment of collaboration and unity. Just as Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, we can serve others with humility and create a positive impact in their lives. Additionally, finding rest for our souls is a vital aspect of our spiritual well-being. In the midst of our fast-paced lives, we often neglect the need for rest and rejuvenation. Jesus' invitation to take his yoke upon us reminds us of the importance of surrendering our burdens to him. We can find rest by spending time in prayer, meditating on scripture, and seeking quiet moments of reflection. It is in these moments that we allow Jesus to speak to our hearts, bring clarity to our minds, and offer us the peace that surpasses all understanding. As we conclude our exploration of Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, let's remember that Jesus' heart is not just a distant concept, but a living reality that can shape our lives today. By embracing his gentleness and humility and by accepting his invitation to find rest, we can experience a profound transformation within ourselves and in our interaction with others. Now, who wouldn't want a heart like Jesus to be kind, to be gentle, to be lowly in heart, to be compassionate, to be loving, to be considerate, to have our strength under control? Who wouldn't want that? Well, the truth is we were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And the Bible tells us that the human heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. We come to this earth needing a heart transplant. And that only comes through saving faith. It only comes through accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He wants you to have his heart. And if there's something that has sparked something in you that says, yes, I want the heart of Jesus, then just say this simple prayer with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I confess I was born a sinner in need of a savior. I confess that my heart is wicked and my heart is deceitful. Lord, I'm asking you to come into my life. I accept you as Lord and savior. Lord, forgive me for all of my sins. I repent today and I accept you as Lord of my life. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Come into my heart. Change me, mold me and transform me into the heart of Jesus. And it is in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with faith, then congratulations. You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and you now have the heart of Jesus Christ. So now the work begins to develop that heart 
And it comes through studying scripture and being in a Bible based church. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me on this extended journey today. I hope this reflection has inspired you to dive deeper into the New Testament and discover more about the heart of Jesus. Until then, may your hearts be filled with peace. May your spirits be refreshed and may you walk in the footsteps of our gentle and humble Savior. Take care and God bless. Thank you.